And my presentation will focus on the evolution of the protests that uh, started happening in Brazil in 2013. So the story I'm going to tell you starts in the summer of 2013 uh, when a small group of student leaders, student demonstrators, just like you, uh, marched the streets of Brazil asking for the reduction of uh, bus fare prices in the country. So there was a 20, a 20 cent increase in bus fare prices and Brazilian uh, students uh, marched the streets of Sao Paulo to protest that increase. So it was a demand associated with the lower class. Uh, but that movement was met with intense police repression in its beginnings and images like this were all over social media which ignited pop popular support for this movement. Um, by the end of June, about 2.5 million people had marched the streets of Brazil and now the movement was no longer about poor people and poor students. It became about something else. Uh, just general dissatisfaction with the state of the country uh, at the end of uh, Dilma, Dilma Rousseff's first government. Dilma was a left-leaning president in Brazil. Uh, what was really interesting was that at the end of this cycle of contention, the original student movement decided to leave the demonstrations. Uh, what they said was that, and that was back in 2013, the right had co-opted our movement. The, the right had uh, raked uh, our ideals and we don't want to be marching with those folks. But uh, despite that, uh, President Duma was re-elected uh, and in March of 2015, uh, another wave of uh, movement, another wave of protest took over the country and that's the one Leonora was talking about. And it's a very, very different uh, type of social movement. Uh, protesters were elite oriented. Um, they uh, had had large support of the upper and, and middle, up, middle and upper middle class. Uh, they they had support for cons from conservative politicians, and as you can see, they were majorly white, uh, as opposed to the 2013 movement that was much more diverse. Also important here is the role of and the relationship between the police and these protesters. Uh, if you compare the way the student uh, group was treated with the way the relation with the way the police, the military police treated the 2015 um, protesters, was completely different. Right? It was very common to see uh, pictures like that, uh, protesters taking selfies with the riot police, which is completely counterintuitive if you think about uh, how protests work. Um, and, and that says a lot about the beginning of the militarization of that movement. What I'm going to argue uh, with you today, uh, in this presentation I will tell you some findings of a long line of research that I have been conducting since 2013. Um, but my main argument is that journalistic norms and routines work in favor of right-wing uh, protesters, always legitimizing them when they are aligned with conservative official sources. It is important to note that in 2015, we are not talking, those protests were right-leaning and were anti-workers' party, but we're not talking about extreme right-leaning as the majority of the protesters. It would be unfair for me to say that the millions of Brazilians who marched the streets were asking for the return of the military regime, because that's not true. But you did have a small group that started tapping into those sentiments right back then, including uh, Jair Bolsonaro, which was not uh, accepted by the movement, but also uh, vocally, always vocally supported it. So what do we know about how uh, journalists cover protests? And you probably maybe noticed that when you're consuming your own news. Uh, these studies in the United States show that journalists usually focus on the deviant parts of protesters. So the emphasis will be on uh, violence and deviant behavior and not a lot of space is given to the ideas and um, demands of the movement, uh, which leads to a coverage that's usually delegitimizing for uh, for the social movement. So you focus on this uh, episodes of violence, you focus on the actions of protesters, and you depict them as idiots. So that's actually what the frame is called, the idiot frame, uh, as uh, people who have no capacity to make an important social critique. However, since 2013, this is the coverage that the Brazilian media has been doing uh, for this protest. Uh, this is a newspaper from my hometown. I'm from Manaus, the northern part of Brazil. Uh, and the headline says, uh, uses the hashtag of the movement, that's a 2013 story, and it says, the, the uh, people from the Amazon give a citizenship lesson in protest. The lead, which is the most important part of a news story, uh, will say, people from Manaus show that it's possible to show their grievances and ask for change in a peaceful and festive way and happy way. Again, think about what we know from the literature on the protest paradigm. This is exactly the opposite. 
So that, uh, that's, that was the starting point uh, for me questioning how, like what? Uh, can all theory be wrong? Uh, but let me give you uh, some context here for those of you who are not familiar with Brazilian media system. Uh, it is market driven, so we do have uh, the, the, the companies are commercial, they're not government sponsored. Uh, only about five families, four big families of fifth one, own the whole system, the whole apparatus. So there are oligopolies that uh, are family based. So these families have been run, have been running the media since the military regime, most of them. Uh, they are not partisan uh, in the sense of they're not aligned with specific political parties. Uh, and that happens also because Brazil has, last time I checked, 23 political parties. So it's not as easy to have the political par parallelism uh, that we see in Southern Europe, for example. And journalists follow or they're trained to follow the US norms of professionalism. I was a journalist in Brazil. What we learn in school is that coverage should be objective, we should try to be impartial, we should try to be neutral, the whole uh, package of US journalism. Now, if they, the implementation of that, we could question, but th those are the norms of professionalism that guide the profession. Um, so I would expect that they would follow the protest paradigm because they're subjected to the same, same type of work, same norms, same rules. Um, that was uh, the, the beginning of a line, uh, a long line of press, uh, press protest studies that I've been conducting since 2013. Um, these studies use several methods and I'm not going to go into detail about them, but I content analyzed all newspapers and the coverage in the two years. Uh, I surveyed 1,250 Brazilian journalists with a quantitative survey asking about their attitudes towards the protest and the uh, information about their employers and the big media and all of that. And then I match those two. So say, uh, João Silva answered my survey and wrote a story for that newspaper. So I had the data set that matched that. Uh, and then I conducted in-depth interviews and the ones that I think are most relevant to this presentation are the ones that I conducted with eight journalists that work for what we call in Brazil the big media. So they, those are the folks who covered the protests for the four conglomerates, so that those four newspapers and their associated global, the global newspaper, also global TV. So I had representatives from this big conglomerates telling me how do they go about covering this. Um, Here's what I found. First, let's talk about the, how journalists feel about protests because there is a, a lot of misconceptions about uh, the way Brazilian journalists think. Um, here, what I found that 2013, the green line is the level of support that journalists themselves, the individual reporter had for the left-leaning protests. This is what for the right-leaning protest. Um, as you can see, journalists in 2013 were very supportive of the movement. Uh, the vast majority of them thought that they were the movement was democratic. They they believed their demands were valid and all that. Uh, however, they did see that, and that's the yellow line, that mainstream media in general was not supportive of the movement. In 2015, those differences get a lot bigger. Uh, they will be very, they, they will not like the right wing movement. They don't think they're legitimate. Open ended questions, they will say, these people are crazy. I don't understand what's happening. Um, but they thought the mainstream media was very positive. But in both years, they think their employers are neutral. Why, why do I think that's super interesting? Is that I, I do have reporters from Globo, Globo is the biggest conglomerate in Brazil, saying that their employer is neutral, but the big media is biased. I don't know what, com what comes to their mind when they think about big media, but to me, it, they're, they're a huge part of the big media. So there is a, a disconnection between the impression of their work versus the impression of the work of other journalists. Uh, but their coverage was the opposite. In 20, the 2015, the right-wing coverage, uh, the, the coverage of the right-wing movement was definitely more supportive than the coverage of the left-leaning movement. We see that, uh, that, that those stories were thematic, they contextualized the protests, they gave them voices, they gave good quotes. Um, that was be, uh, so that would indicate, my first thought was that there's self-censorship happening, right? Journalists are trying to please their employers. But I did ask that question. What do you think your employer feel about this? And when you enter that on statistical models, you see that that's actually not a factor at all. So this self-correction, this correction, the, the inverse relationship between 
my personal attitudes and the way my stories talk about this movement goes beyond just self-censorship. I actually found no evidence of self-censorship, uh, neither by journalists telling me or by numeric findings. That's why I asked them, so what? In 2013, what they, what they told me was that even though they supported the movement, they were really afraid of being seen as biased. Uh, so they ended up, and they're very aware that they ended up overcorrecting that. Uh, we're afraid of being seen as biased, and we were afraid of sh showing that the protests are legitimate would make the, the tensions escalate, would create more conflict. And as professional journalists, and that's the thing I've heard the most, as professional journalists, I have to hide my biases. Uh, what, what, what ends up happening is that then they overcorrected so much that their coverage became really negative. There's hardly any space for demands. That didn't happen in 2015, even for the journalists who supported the movement. Uh, because of the car wash operation, because of this anti-corruption mentality that Leonora was talking about. Uh, in 2015, um, the, the quotes from journalists, they would always be along the lines of this. Uh, everyone knew what the demands are, everyone knew what, that they were valid, and then all these conservative official sources were giving us quotes. And um, I, I don't know if, if I have any journalists in the room, but if you're a journalist and a congressman calls you to give you a quote about something, you will publish that because that person has weight. An official source has a lot of weight. The norms of journalism really uh, give them a lot of advantage and a lot of space on news coverage. Uh, for the 2015 protests, uh, you would see lots and lots of conservative official voices being quoted, way more than actual protester voices. Um, here's a comparison. So if you, if you do the content analysis, in 2013 uh, you had a pretty balanced coverage. You had official sources who talked to journal, quotes from official sources, quotes from protester sources, quotes from others who were experts or bystanders, and even some social media quotes, like tweet, tweets pulled from social media. In 2015, most of the quotes were from official sources. Uh, I would rarely, I've read all of the stories, you would rarely see a quote from actual protesters. You'd see a quote from the senator who went to the protest sharing his thoughts and feelings about this. One of these people, oops, one of these people was Jair Bolsonaro. Uh, Jair Bolsonaro was actually rejected by the movement at, in 2015. He tried to be righted, so he went to the demo demonstrations and he tried to speak, but the, the protesters booed him and uh, did not let him speak. But newspapers, he's a congressman. He goes to the reporter and he gives his quote. And the reporter will publish that, even though the quote had nothing to do with the movement. So he's free writing that movement. Uh, also interesting was that in 2015, this is March, uh, March 15th of, 20, uh, of 2015, a story that says uh, an icon of the far right with no evidence to support that, uh, which is kind of a, a bias, that's how he described himself at that time, um, requested the impeachment, but that's not gonna, gonna go well because he can't, he's not taken seriously even by his own, the people in his own party. Now how things have changed, right? This guy, a year later, a year later, exactly a year later, the impeachment proceedings were accepted, and now uh, a couple of years later, he's, he's likely going to win the election. Uh, here was about in the, in the protests, even though he didn't speak, he had nothing to do with this, there's a quote from him. So there was a lot of space. He, he masterfully inserted himself in this narrative of this right-wing social movement that Leonora was describing and tried to, he basically free rode the movement. Uh, now what's, to me, a, a question for a future research agenda is to see when did this convergence happen? Because uh, today, if you look at Bolsonaro's platform, it's very much uh, a fusion between uh, the Movimento Brasil Livre, the right-wing social movement that brought the people to the streets, and his own agenda. The clothes that people who support Bolsonaro wear are the, the soccer jerseys that the, the protesters wore. Um, today, MBL, the, this movement, uh, is acting basically as a propaganda machine for him. Uh, including Facebook shut down several accounts based with, from them because of fake news charges. So these two groups converged in a way that um, led to this uh, successful presidential run uh, by the candidate. And that was my last slide.
again, I would like to come back to this uh, idea of how come, how it come, these ideas, these extreme ideas became legitimized and how much of that comes from the ways in which the norms of journalism, the norms of news gathering, reporting, and the weight of official sources uh, play out when it comes to when it comes to journalists putting together these narratives about what is this political crisis. And the, to me, what uh, what Bolsonaro did very successfully, and I think here we can draw an interesting parallel with Trump, was to be able to channel all of this, uh, all of the right wing social movement momentum, and then when questioned by the media, he turns it around and calls the media fake news. Uh, both candidates will do that now. So uh, the, he would call this journalist to give these quotes, and then because the quotes were usually not that favorable, that became evidence that all the media in the country are communists, which is completely insane to me, uh, given that I talked to all these journalists and I content analyzed it. It's it's. I don't understand how someone can say Globo is a communist, uh, but he does. So it, it, he built this narrative of no one, no, I use the news media to get a platform, but I can never be questioned by them. And, and that convergence of, of the social movement with his discourse is definitely something that I'm going to uh, continue to investigate as we move forward. Um, but thank you. I, will, I, I look forward to hearing your thoughts about this as well. Parallels are very clear. Uh, the use of social media as the, a direct communication between the candidate and it, the audiences. Uh, Trump has been very successful, set the tone for that. When Trump won, that's when Bolsonaro did his first press conference where he said, well, we have a chance of winning. So he's definitely inspired by Trump policies and the tactics of uh, social media guerrilla, uh, I, I would call it, for this bombarding uh, these platforms with information and sometimes misinformation in order to bypass skepticism that they would, he would face on a press conference. My, uh, my guess is that Bolsonaro would be very much like Trump as a president. He would not host press conferences or debates or do interviews or things like that. He would just go to, although Fox News is a communist for Bolsonaro too. So I don't know who, who this is going to go to, uh, um, but but not, not going just to the he he would just seek these official sources. So from a media perspective, definitely a parallel there. Um, obviously, issues about what it means to nationalism, uh, what it means Brazil above everyone else. That's the slogan of the campaign. And if you remember uh, Trump's uh, Trump's inaugural speech was all about America first. And Bolsonaro is very much Brazil is similar to tudo. Deus is similar to tudo. Like Brazil above everyone and God above all else. Uh, so it's a very much the same slogan of us first, uh, the rights of majorities. One other thing that I think perhaps is the most important and decisive thing uh, in these two elections is the power of hate. I think uh, both candidates, both ca both Trump and uh, I, I do study a lot of uh, fake news and uh, partisan media ecosystems in the United States. And I think both Trump and Bolsonaro have capitalized on this hate for the other. I would even argue that based on the focus of what hyperpartisan media coverage, it was not that Trump won. It was really that people hated Hillary Clinton and they were going to vote for anyone. If, it, if not for Hillary Clinton. She was corrupt, she was the swamp, lock her up, the whole package. Bolsonaro is the same. I, I, I wouldn't necessarily think that 60% of Brazilians are, are voting, him for, voting on him for his demands or for his proposals or things like that, but they really, really hate the Workers' Party. So for reasons, some reasons they are valid, others that we may discuss, but that this capitalization on hate and this victory is based on hate. I think it's, it's definitely a, the same thing for both countries, and I, I suspect for many other countries as we move forward in this right-wing way uh, of, of successful right-wing candidates winning elections, winning popular elections. We'd like to open it up for questions. My question's for you about the scandals about WhatsApp and sharing uh, fake news through WhatsApp. So what's your perspective as a journalist to all the scandals that are happening? Taking into consideration the study that they showed that only four of the 50 most shared images in WhatsApp 
were uh, real, and also the affirmation that there are people sponsoring the proliferation, plurif is that a word? Proliferation of content in that platform. What's that bit tricky? So I studied that very easily in the United States, right? You go to these websites that exist here, and I see what stories get shared on Facebook and Twitter, and that's actually quite straightforward. I can know what's the scope of how many people are being affected by each type of story. But WhatsApp is a black box. Uh, we can't collect, the, as researchers, we can't collect data from WhatsApp. So I suspect we don't, we have no clue how much fake news and people got and what's the scope of this problem. And I think that's what's tricky for us to fight it uh, without resorting to some sort of censorship, which can be problematic as well. Uh, the truth is uh, the candidate has successfully uh, engaged in, in employing the social media strategies to uh, send, to bypass mainstream media. So I speak directly to my um, electorate. Uh, when you do have campaign finance in that, then that obviously becomes an electoral crime, and I think that's an issue that um, justice should address. But to know how much of an impact those stories had on people's votes, I wouldn't say it's impossible to measure because anything is possible, but it's very hard from a researcher's perspective. Um, we do some sort of experiments sometimes uh, w with that, and a lot of people have a utilitarian mindset when it comes to fake news. So say you are a Bolsonaro supporter, and I send you that picture of, I don't know if you've seen that, Ciro Gomez beat up the famous actress, right? Fake news, totally made up. She came up and said no. If I tell you that that's a lie, you'll say, well, but it serves a bigger purpose, so you share it anyway. So the, the, this, the, the ends justify the means. So there's a lot of people that do that. Uh, I'm not sure these fake news have changed anyone's mind, to be honest. <coughs> I think if, you, if you're going to believe, you're going to believe, and you're going to share and all that. I, I, I don't know how much that can actually sway voters. But WhatsApp is a huge we don't know how to, we can't study it. It's all encrypted and um, also for journalists, that really sucks because fact-checking rumors, uh, I don't know if you've, you're familiar, Facebook hired a team of fact-checkers and they were so harassed that Facebook dropped the, pro, the program. So they stopped funding it because the lives of these people were being destroyed. They were just fact-checking rumors on the internet and so that didn't. It, 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 fact checking can be dangerous there too. And WhatsApp is owned by Facebook. WhatsApp is owned by Facebook. You, so you don't think there's any possibility that they'll return to like a military type of dictatorship, do you, in the future? A, a different David. type of coup d'etat, I might, because it's an, it, he's going to get elected, and then you know it's different than in '64 where the president, the president, and power was removed and the armed forces came in. But there's definitely a risk of his election. Just for context, Brazil hasn't had, uh, and correct me if I'm wrong, uh, a, a defense minister who was a military. After the regime, even the military uh, cabinets were supposed to be ruled by civilians because of the risk of them taking over, thank you, taking over power. So now we're speaking of a president and a vice president. Uh, the vice president is a general. We share a last name, but not, not related. Um, and... Um, and then all of his cabinet members may become, you, you may see a militarization that it's not per se illegal because an elected president can do that, but it, it's new uh, and dangerous. All right, uh, please join me then in thanking the speakers. Uh,